Welcome back to another former player interview on Red Tinted Glasses. And tonight we're delighted to be joined by former Aberdeen midfielder Steve Tosh. Steve, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks very much for asking me. And it's very much our pleasure for asking you. And also, we're delighted for you to accept and come on, Calm, fifth former player. Good to see players now willing to accept and, and share stories after the success we had with Jack Grimmer previously. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, as you say, number five. And again, I'll just thank you as well, Steve. Thanks for coming on. No problem. Hopefully I'm the best at the five so far. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> we'll let the viewers and listeners decide. Steve, you signed for Aberdeen in January 2003, making 70 appearances in total for the club. But before we get into your time at Aberdeen, I just want you to take us through your earlier career. Starting off at our broth, you got your first senior appearance there signing for St. Johnson and then your hometown team in Wraith. What was it like, you know, growing up and, and getting your first breaks in professional football? Uh, yeah, I was a late starter. You know, I, I had uh, I'd been at East Fife uh, as a white, uh, as a, an S form, sorry. Uh, and basically at 16, was leaving the school. I uh, was told I was going to get kept on at East Fife. East Fife were a really good first division team at the time. A uh, great little setup, But... Uh, <clears throat> Basically, the story goes, I was waiting to be picked up by the team bus. I, I used to get picked up at a disco called Jackie's in Kirkcaldy, otherwise known as a nightclub these days. And the bus would pick me up and an ex-Aberdeen player, uh, former Aberdeen player Andy Harrow, would take me home. Andy was a Kirkcaldy guy as well. And uh, that happened religiously for a couple of years. And I was told, as I say, even the school, so you had to think, I think it was a Y form you had to sign. Mm -hmm. So seemingly all set up and... I was down there at the right time for the bus to collect me on the Monday morning, eh, the Monday evening, and the bus drove right past. Uh, days before mobile phones, so I then had to go back up to the bus station in Kirkcaldy because I stayed, my mum and dad stayed at the top end of Kirkcaldy, bus all the way up. I go in, my dad wouldn't believe that it was, uh, he thought I'd missed the bus, the team bus, <laughs> and he phoned, and he never got an answer at Bayview, so I went down again on Thursday to get picked up, and the the bus went right past me again and I went to walk away and I, I got the horn peeped at me it was my dad he was actually sitting across because I think again he would have believed that I was late so but bottom line is East Fife released me they, you know and it was hard to take as a 16 year old boy mm -hmm. not because I was getting released just hard to take as to how they'd done it mm -hmm. and I went away and played juvenile football uh, with my mates I went under 18s I went under 21 so which was you know it was a good league in Fife at the time and then I got asked to go and play junior football uh which I did, I signed for Glen Office Juniors. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, two or three clubs, all the Angus clubs, ironically, uh, the four of them, and East Fife came but wanted me to go and sign. So East Fife had changed managers, but they were politely told in non-certain terms that <laughs> it never going to happen. And uh, yeah, I chose our growth. I, I went up to sign with another guy, and then I did the sign, Jockey Scott, who was a manager, who was ex-Aberdeen manager. Mm -hmm. Jockey was raging. Uh, Jockey actually asked me if it was because I was wanting more money. And I didn't even know I was getting money. That was the thing. <laughs> uh, but they, they chased me for an extra couple of weeks. So I, I, the reason I didn't want to sign was Jockey had said that I might get a spot on the bench before the end of the season. I know I had six games left. And my junior team had 16, 17 games left. I was just a daft boy that just wanted to play football. I don't think I ever changed that, but I was just a daft boy that wanted to play football. So I declined their offer, but I got talked into it and I went and I, I was only there sort of the last four or five games of one season, I played a full season and as you say, Paul Sturrock came in and, and purchased me was for, to go to St. Johnson, which was a bit an eye-opener. Spent two, three, three years, I think, three seasons at St. Johnson. Mm -hmm. You know, really good standard of football at the time. First division, uh, Dungeon United's, Dunfermline's, Morton's with Derek McInnes, I don't, you know, that was there at the time and mm -hmm. uh, great league to play in. We eventually won it the second year I was there got promoted, made my debut in the Premier League against Dundee United. And I, I flitted in and out the team that, that next season in 97, 98. And, you know, I was getting, I was 25. And I just said, come to, uh, come to my head and I just basically said to Sturrock, I need, I need to be playing, you know, more often than what I am. Mm -hmm. And he informed me that Wraith and Air United wanted me, but he didn't want to let me go. And of course, I, I, I decided, he'd, what he did say is go and train with Wraith for a couple of days, see how you like it. 
and then we'll make a decision. And you know, I think they showed me to Ray for 50, 60 grand. Uh, it was a no-brainer for me. Mm-hmm. It was ironic. It, it ended up the worst move I made for a period of time because I so wanted it to work and it just did. You know, for a combination of things, Wraith, you know, I went in there and, and as I say, they signed me. I don't even think they paid the transfer fee to St. John's. They end up, they end up skin. And I, I was actually on the verge of going back part-time. I was going to let my contract run out in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was going to let it run out and then just at that, you know, we, we started the season quite well. And then Livingston came in for myself, Big Marvin and, and Alec Burns. And, and the rest of the rest of history after that, my career probably, you know, if we go in my mind to be going to be going back part-time and probably getting a job, mm-hmm. and then it took off and, and, and 10, 11 years later, I was still playing at a decent level. So it just shows you that you're never too sure what's for you or what will go by you. But, you know, it was... That's probably the only disappointing time I had in my career was at, at Wraith and probably because I was so dying for it to, to go well. Mm-hmm. And as you said, you know, just as your career was maybe, in your own words, just fizzling out, Livingston came along and you proved to be quite a pivotal part of the Livingston team that went on to win the first division, promoted to the Premiership and in your first season in the Premiership with Livingston, you finished third. What what was that like? Because that must have been a great Livingston team to be a part of. It was crazy, Glenn. It really was. It was, it was fantastic. I mean, you know, it was so enjoyable. You go into football clubs. Football clubs are very much like the organisations that we all work with. You work with people. You didn't automatically get on with everyone. You know, and, and, and I don't think fans at times comprehend that. They just think that we're all best of mates and we live in each other's pockets. <laughs> For me, it was all about a Saturday. It was all about for fight, fighting for my mate next to me, hoping that he'd fight for me. You know, then his running, if putting him out of trench, if he wasn't doing well, vice versa. Mm-hmm. And at Livingston, I can honestly say at Livingston, Jim Leishman as a manager, as a tactician, isn't very good. Isn't very <laughs> And Leish will tell you that himself, but by God, he got us to play for him. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he got everybody to play. And I can honestly say, probably only a couple of clubs I've been at that if I wasn't playing, I wanted the guy that was in my place to do well. It was that strange. You, you, you rooted for the team, you rooted for the guys that were playing because you kind of knew that further down the line, you'd get back in the team and the boys would be rooting for, for you. And mm-hmm. it was it was just a fantastic club. I played in the midfield uh, when I, I first went there with a guy called Mark McCulloch and, and well, probably, probably the enforcers. We just went and done the running for David Bingham's Barry Wilson's this world. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we went and we went and got the ball and we we played it to boys at the end. But it was a team that it worked and it worked. And we took that the next year, as you say, into the Premier League, you know, and we picked Aberdeen. You know, we, we mm-hmm. it was ourselves in Aberdeen going for third. Uh and we actually come up, you know, we came up to Petodre with, with three games to go. And we got turned over, we got turned over 3 0, and we got hammered. It was, I think it was the first time Aberdeen had really turned us over that season. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we went, we got back in the bus, and we, we got a couple of crates of beer. Like Aberdeen celebrated like they'd won the league that day, you know, and, and <laughs> it didn't stick in the back of our throats because we were Livingston. We were yeah. the mm-hmm. to finish up there. So we were kind of thinking, well, fourth, what a fantastic season. And I always remember after the game at Aberdeen, you go into the players' lounge, a couple of beers. Aberdeen, I always give you a couple of crates of beer for the bus to go back down the road, every club. And we got back on the bus and 3 0 defeat. Boys were straight to the beer. That's what we've done at Livingston. We, we really liked our beer after the game. We liked to, we did, we, you know, a lot of folk will laugh. We, we liked to be a club like that. And Leash got us, Leash came up the back of the bus and he, he basically said to us, We're pulling off at Stonehaven. And he took us into a pub in Stonehaven for an hour. He says, We're stopping for an hour. The drinks are on me. It's been absolutely fantastic this season. You so then get Monday, Sunday and Monday off, and we'll see you Tuesday. And it was a master stroke. We came back, you know, we we got I think we put into that boozer in Stonehaven. There was obviously Aberdeen fans in by that time. I think <laughs> looked at ourselves as if to say, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. I've got a bit of crack, as you could imagine, you know, I we've got finished mm-hmm. third. And we still we knew that we had done Fermin and Hearts to play, and we knew that you guys, Aberdeen, you obviously had Rangers and Celtic. We knew that Rangers weren't going to lie down. And then it went to the last game of the season and I think <laughs> an Aberdonian, Sean Maloney, scored the only goal. And, mm-hmm. you know, we, we went to Tynecastle. We beat Hearts four times that year. We went to Tynecastle and won 3-2. And as you say, it was quite funny because at the start of the season we had our bonuses set up for uh, staying up. 
<laughs> we never had a bonus written in for qualifying for Europe. <laughs> so we had to kind of go and negotiate after the season had finished to get an additional sum of uh, money for finished in a European spot. And it's great to see them doing just well just now. Yeah, you mm, know, definitely. Without taking anything away from them, and I, I would say they're doing well in a how do I, how do I word that? I, I'm never never normally PC, so <laughs> and that isn't as good. That's the truth. Mm-hmm. The league, the standards mm-hmm. no good. You know that that league that we finished third in the league in that was a hell of a standard, and it was yeah. a hell of an accomplishment. And it probably will only be repeated that a team will come up for the first division stroke championship and finish third in the Premier League their first their first go ever again. No, and, and it was a fair achievement, and I, I do agree. It's great to see clubs like Livingston, and with the greatest of respect, them obviously, you know, the cup final to look forward to. Um, you know, it's it's great to see these clubs performing well. Definitely, we need a. You know, we, listen, Celtic's won nine in a row. Thankfully, mm. they're not going to get ten in a row. You know, I, I, it was great for Aberdeen for a period of time. They're coming second in the league. You know, and I think Derek. They're still punching above the, you know, or when they say they're now punching above their weight, but they need to finish third. Third's where mm-hmm. Aberdeen we expect to finish. You know, the disappointing thing is we've dropped so many points this year, and there was a chance that we could have split Rangers and Celtic because Celtic have been so poor. Yeah, you know, but it's probably not going to be. But Derek will be concentrating. But no, I, I love seeing, and again, I love it the fact that it was Livingston that are doing so well this year because, as I say, as a club that hold dear, but. Uh, yeah, that was me. I had two two good seasons at Livingston. Should have stayed, but Leash decided to replace me with a guy that played for Barcelona. So that tells a story, doesn't it? So. <laughs> um, when that sort of came about, you ended up going on loan to Falkirk for about six months. Did you sort of know that was the beginning of the end of your time at Livingston? You would be moving on, or did you think you might come back, get back in the team? No, I didn't go on loan. I, I, I left Livingston. I left at the end of my contract, so I didn't actually go on loan to, to okay. Falkirk. I'll blame uh, Wikipedia for that that poor mm, bit of research. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, so my contract did come to an end and, and they'd offered me a deal uh, at Christmas stroke New Year and then they kind of went back on it a wee bit and mm. I'm a wee bit of man in principle and I was like, well, nah, you're not doing that. And it come to the end of the season and I, I knew, I guess, I knew that Leash was, I knew when I hadn't signed my contract that there was a good chance that they were going to just say, right, we'll let your contract run out. Mm-hmm. I thought my agent had spoke to Kilmarnock. It looked like I was going to go to Kilmarnock. And then Jim Jeffries, for some reason, had chosen, I think, I think he went and got Gary Locke. You know, and, mm-hmm. and that happens in football. I had two or three options uh, down south that were starting to look at. I went away on holiday, had had most of the summer off, went on holiday, came back. And, and be fair, it was Ian McCall phone me and he basically said, uh, it was just a shame I couldn't get you in. I, I think you'd have done really well for us, and, but we can't match your wages demand. And I basically asked them, well, you've lost me because I didn't even know I had the wages demand. So <laughs> uh, I, he asked me, for me to go into training and I went and done a bit of training. really enjoyed it. Great pros, Yogi, Owen Coyle, Big Kevin James, you know, with a, a, a lot of experience in there with a mix of youth, Lee Miller, Mark Kerr, mm-hmm. two boys that have come in and played for Aberdeen, Colin Samuel, the, the guy for Trinidad and Tobago. Mm-hmm. You know, I went, the base, they, they made me as good an offer as it could basically make me. And again, I, I'm, I'm brought up, born and brought, brought up in a council estate in Kirkcaldy. Money was near the be on end though. Mm-hmm. You know, again, wanted to play football. And it was, as I say, it was a good offer. I was probably Falkirk's best paid, paid player, but it was now fortunes and I thought nah this, this will do for me it's 30 minutes with Kirkcaldy it's a decent club I, Ian McCall sold it pretty well so no I wasn't on loan I actually went and signed mm. for them for I think I signed a two year deal actually and then but as you say six months later uh, pastures new yeah and how did the sort of Aberdeen interest come about when did you first hear of that when I came back for training one day never had a clue I did <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd, we'd, we'd start the season really well I think we went 13 games I think we'd won the vast majority and then I got I got sent off up at Perth uh, against St Johnson uh, I do get McDonald's special he actually sent me off twice he sent me off in the pitch then I, I got called in after the game and he sent me off again for calling, calling him on the pitch what I kind of thought of him at the time mm. uh, it's not like you <laughs> no very unlike me you've got to remember I'm just I'm just a fan with a jersey I, I nah. should but you should but unfortunately I'm a wee bit closer to the ref and uh, <laughs> no I, I got sent off but I, it, 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 I, got, I think I got a four-game suspension and it done me a favour because 
my knee was giving me jip, so I, I really needed to go in and get an operation. So I went in and got my knee done. Mm. It was just cleaned out. I went and got my knee cleaned out, and I two weeks off, came back, started training, and I think I think I'd maybe played was back in the team, and then we went training on Tuesday, came back after training, and Ian McCall asked me to come and see him in his office. So sorry, I'm going it. You know that I'm obviously going to go out with somebody. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I went in the see him and he basically said that we've had an offer for a team and that we're reluctant to accept it. However, we'd like you to be able to be able to make the choice if you want. And I says, Well, not be funny, who is that? You know, and mm. because I never had a clue. And he says it's Aberdeen. And I've got to be honest, uh Usain Bolt wouldn't have been out of his office. I was out of his office <laughs> in, the boot, in, in the boot room. Collected everything and Ian McCall basically said, So I take it you're uh, says, Well, look, not being funny, but it's Aberdeen, you know, mm. it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a team that I used to go and watch when I was a kid. It's uh, you know, I was I'm not going to give it the big Aberdeen fan, but I probably went to when it through the ages, uh, I don't know, nine through uh, 12, 13, I probably went to two, three hundred Aberdeen games, you know, I was. So mm. it was, uh, I was lucky I got to see them in the 80s. Mm. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I decided I can't. I, I knew I was coming up to speak and I knew that it was going to need to be something tragic that wasn't going to allow it to happen, i.e. Mm-hmm. It was just going to be ridiculous. Or, and again, came up and it was going to, as I say, as soon as I came in, the wages were a okay. They weren't nothing fantastic, but it was Aberdeen and that was, mm-hmm. that was me. I was timed and... Uh, a happy person. Uh, it was Steve Patterson that brought you to the club. What was that like working under him? I love Pele. I, I, I do. You, in fact, you look a wee bit like Pele with that hair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's the lockdown haircut, but we'll, we'll, we'll take I'm, it. I'm kind of I'm worried about your age when when you were born and fat Pele was kicking about. You better have a wee question to ask, actually. You know. So <laughs> I'll be speaking to my dad after this. See what's going I on. Was, what, I would speak more to your mum than your dad partner. Mm, you know? Good point. <laughs> Pele was actually <laughs> probably the first proper manager that I remember at Aberdeen I was because I moved back to Aberdeen in 2002 so it's kind of the end of the Scovedale era so your time at Aberdeen was probably the first proper like when I started going regularly so that yeah. team like 2003-04 was the Aberdeen teams I grew up with so Pele was like my first experience of Aberdeen manager so I that was what's that that was difficult for Pele you know mm. it, it, Pele, Pele had managed the Inverness and done superbly well as well. He'd, mm-hmm. he'd, done, he'd done it with a squad of 18. Out of that 18, two or three being youngish kids. So what Pele had achieved was kind of like what we had at Livingston, but on a lesser scale, because we had a big squad at Livingston. Mm. Pele had a small squad at Cali. So the boys put up ways his bad habits, his drinking, his gambling, his, you know, and, and listen, we, we, we know the story. It's, it was a curse of Pele was that he was such a nice guy, but he just couldn't control certain things that others mm-hmm. can. Uh, but no, I, 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 I can't say a bad word about him. Mm-hmm. Was he professional? No. Was, it, <laughs> was he a great manager? No. But there was something about him that you endeared to him. You know, it wasn't a bad manager. He knew what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Pele was, you've also got to understand that every school will cost that club millions mm-hmm. and every school well, was paying certain players five, six, seven thousand a pound a week. Pelly was then asked to go and get players on fifteen hundred pounds a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and Pelly was so I think Pelly was sold a bit of a dead duck, if mm-hmm. I'm being perfectly honest. Yeah. It worked it worked great for me. It allowed me to come in and play for a fantastic football club, a fantastic set and a fantastic set of fans. It, mm-hmm. it gave me that, you know, uh but I think Pelly was he, he was potentially the right person for the job and his life probably at the wrong time. Yeah. You know, but mm-hmm. I listen, I, I laugh and joke and I think Pelly would allow it. I'm Pelly was drinking heavy at the time. I think it was maybe Paul Toshi wanted and he ended up with me. That's how I'd say people, <laughs> you know. And and but it was it was it was a it, it was a great move for me. So I, I can only have happy memories of Stevie Parson and bring me to Aberdeen. Yeah, and I think most Aberdeen fans will have happy memories of him, of you, sorry, coming to the club. But Russell Anderson kind of echoes some of the sentiments you've said there about, you know, 
probably the wrong time for him or he maybe didn't understand the enormity of the job that he was undertaking at Aberdeen. Um, but for you personally, when you signed, um, it was a wee trip to Portugal in January for the Algarve Cup. That must have been nice. Was that the main attraction then when you signed a wee job to Portugal? <laughs> a, wee, a, wee, a wee trip away, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah it's quite funny because when I left Aberdeen week to go to Gretna, the next week they were going to La Manga, so that tells your story as well. So, <laughs> so you just looked no, at the holidays. I, I didn't even know. I just, I, I obviously, at the time, it was the Premier League were doing winter breaks. Uh, I didn't know Aberdeen had anything planned, as, you know, until obviously I'd signed, and it was, oh, by the way, you need your passport because we're going to Portugal next week. So, no, nah, I, I, was, I was unaware of, of that. But, no, nah, it was, again, it was great for me, great for Peanut, Paul Sheeran, sorry, he came in as well. Great because once you got away with the boys, it's easier to interact for a week when you're away. Mm. You're all staying in the hotel. You're you're eating together. You're you know you're all staying on the same floor of the hotel. So no, it was good. It was good to get away. And as you say, you know, start Aberdeen life with with two games in in Portugal. Yeah, against um, Wolfsburg and Ajax, an Ajax team that included a, a young Zlatan Ibrahimovic. <laughs> I do remember that, but Wolfsburg had the World Cup winners. You know, Wolfsburg had Stefan Effenberg that won the 1990 World Cup. So mm-hmm. my first ever game was playing against the 1990 World Cup winners. So, you know, and again, it was, uh, we, we laugh about it because I tell the same story. It was myself and Ross, Ross O'Donoghue in mm-hmm. the middle of the park. So I'm not so sure if Stefan Effenberg tells a story about playing against me and Ross. <laughs> or, or, <laughs> Never know. Or, them, you know, so no, we played Wolfsburg, uh, and then as you say, three or four days later on the Saturday, we played against Ajax, a young Zlatan. Uh, I think if you look through their team, it was a bit of who's who. I think Ronald Koeman was a manager, and I think there was mm-hmm. a lot. Of, I, I think if I'm right, Schneider and Van de Vaar, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and there was a right Johnny Hettinger that played at Everton as well. Oh, that yeah. played, and uh, the, the best story about that was we left the hotel and we went to the. the the ground, uh, Lule, in a place called Lule, and it was an older ground, but it was, you know, they, they'd obviously, they, they'd done a bit tarting it up, and the dress rooms were all whitewashed, you know, they'd just paint them, and, or, and Pelly had sent us out to the park, and as well was do, you go, you have a look at the pitch, and we came back in, and we all just started laughing. And they'd forgot the tactics board, so Pelly had wrote the team up in black marker pen on the whitewashed walls. <laughs> oh dear. And, and, and it, the, the hilarious thing about it is I think he'd put Russell's name in twice at centre-half and still told him, Gafford, you've got Russell playing this centre So rather than just saying, oh, that's a mistake, it should have been Maguire or whatever, mm-hmm. he started scoring it out in black marker. <laughs> <laughs> so just to, just to make the job worse, you know, and we're, but that, that was just typical Pele. But I think we, mm-hmm. got beat, we got beat 2-1 that night, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure who scored the two goals for... Uh, Ajax, but uh, it was Daz Markey got Daz Markey scored for Aberdeen, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and and if I'm being honest, and, and, and listen, it, it's, these these things are great now. They're a great medium for getting stories out. The truth is, not a lot of people know it. And, and again, Stevie won't mind me saying, that was probably the, the first time we'd seen these problems because mm-hmm. we went out, we got free rain to go out on the Saturday. We were flying back on the Sunday after the Ajax game. And uh, we went, we're staying in a place called Monte Gordo. And we went back and we, it was a quiet resort, it was January, you know, we went out and I think it got to about two o'clock in the morning and myself and Steve, uh, Pele, uh, myself and Peanut, Paul Sheeran decided to call it a night. We were leaving at seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning. The, the manager was still out. He was, mm. you know, and we were on the bus, I think I might be nine o'clock, we were on the bus at nine o'clock in the morning waiting to go to the airport hangovers as you'd expect and mm-hmm. there was only one person on the bus and that, that was the manager and he came out and you could tell we'd been on it for quite a bit of the night uh, and it wasn't great Keith Wynes was there and you know it mm-hmm. didn't look particularly great and I think that was the first I really seen that there was maybe a wee issue there uh, yeah. but he had it he had it well as, as most people do that have got drink problems he had it mm-hmm. quite well you know, and it was, it's just a shame it was a shame how it came out and it's but it had to come out in the end and, and hopefully Stevie's a lot better for it these days. No, no, I hope so. You know, you, you say there that you, you, you came up against World Cup winners, a young Zlatan Ibrahimovic. You came into a team consisting of Roberto Bisconti, Ben Thornley, Russell Anderson, you've mentioned there, Lauren DeJaffo, as well as um, Peanut, you, Paul Sheeran, who you referred to as well. What was that team like? Did, did that time in Portugal really help you guys? With Bisconti and Thornley, Ben, we Benny was 
fine. Then he was just in the the one to Bisconti. Bisconti was a problem by that time. He was mm. he was a problem for the football club because his attitude was one, and and also the fact that he was on a small fortune and Aberdeen were cutting back. Mm. Uh, so Roberto, I only trained with him a few times. He, he, he was actually they'll try to they'll try to get my way. He actually he didn't he didn't travel to Portugal with us, uh, and neither did Benny. I, I knew Ben from obviously playing against him. Ben was a cracking guy. He trained still a wee bit, but he didn't go either. Mm. Uh, so they were they were there. Big Lorne was when he was on his game and he fancied that brilliant, mm-hmm. horrific trainer. Didn't he really? Didn't he give a jot in training? Didn't he train well? You know, uh, when he wasn't playing, he had that the arrogance and attitude that didn't he bode well. And I know just Lauren, you mm-hmm. know, but we, we probably could have done well. Lauren Dejaffo, Pelly could have done well. Because when he played and when you got him right, he was a, he was an asset. Yeah. It, just, it just didn't happen often enough. Yeah, especially when you didn't have a Leon Mike firing on all cylinders either. Uh, Geezer was a Geezer was a bad dog. Geezer, you know, Geezer. It wasn't for the, it wasn't for lack of effort and trying. But as you say, he's a striker. It just didn't, it just didn't work for Geezer. He wasn't, mm. he wasn't fit either. You know, he was carrying a wee bit. He was probably yeah. carrying a wee bit. And uh, yeah, and then we, we brought, you know, Pelly tried to bring in uh, Lee Hines, and again, Lee, Lee was probably very much like. Geezer, it just it, it, he just didn't score as often as we, and for a mm-hmm. striker, try and score goals at the at the onset and get you off and running, ain't you? You know, and it it just didn't work. Yeah, so a proper throwback. Some of these names. Um, when it came to domestic, um, you started out the your first Aberdeen game in the league was a one nil defeat to to Hearts last minute. We then drew away to Queen of the South in the Scottish Cup. Um, before a trip to Ibrox, uh, I, we lost that game, but you scored your first goal for Aberdeen at Ibrox. Um, quite a famous picture there of you celebrating in front of the away end. Did did that start to your Aberdeen career kind of make you realise what you'd got into? Um, but just and as well, what was it like scoring at Ibrox for Aberdeen? So I, I guess the the initial part, but you know we 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 played hard. Eh, sorry, I thought I thought my first game was Queen of South away. I, I, I might be wrong. You might have it right. Maybe mm. it wasn't. I know Hearts was the first league game. Uh, yeah. But Queen of South, you know, we didn't play well. We should have went to the Scottish Cup down there at Palmerston. Mm-hmm. I think we beat them 3 or 4 1 in the replay. 4 1 in the replay, yeah. Andre, where a young Stevie Payne actually came into the, the team and, and done quite well. Uh, mm-hmm. But the Ibrox one, you know, it, uh, I still get tingles yet if I ever see the go of it shown again. If, the fact that, that, you know, for me, it was one of my best goals, just the way it, it, it happened. And, as you say, to, it was probably one of the first years that Aberdeen had just got that small corner as well, you know, yeah. it was, it was a, and it was heaving. And the, it, the score at that end, to wheel away and, and see, as you say, the delight. Uh, no, it was brilliant. It was, it, 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 listen, if you're going to score your first goal for Aberdeen, it says, well been against Rangers, then, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, and it was, it was just a shame that we didn't get the result. Uh, and, Probably through my Aberdeen career, I was ne- never got very many results against Rangers actually, but mm-hmm. it, it was. But no, it was it was. Aye, it was great for me. Uh, it probably helped me settle in. It but also probably helped me bode well with the, the supporters, you know. And and mm-hmm. and it still is for me. It still gets talked about yet, which is great. The amount of people that will come up and say, oh, "I remember your first ever goal." I was at, it was amazing because I think we only got a thousand people in that, but the amount of people yeah. that. Or mm. there that day's dwarf thousand people. So, mm. you know, every, everybody I seem to speak, they say they were at the game, you know, and some of them weren't even born. So I don't know how that worked. But <laughs> well, I was good. speaking to my, my former colleague today um, about about interviewing you because he's got a better memory of, of that sort of time because mine was still a bit sketchy from, from being young. And he said, ask him about that goal because it was my first trip to Ibrox. And he said, it was a proper seat changer goal. He said, I didn't when when I stopped celebrating. I was definitely not in the same seat, let alone the same row. as when when the ball left his foot. If you watch the celebration as I wheel away, I'm obviously getting a bit of dogs abuse for the Rangers fans behind the goals. Mm. If you watch my reaction, uh, my, my, I, I gave the big get it up, you. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that was the brightest thing to do, but it's just it, it, it was sheer emotion, you know. And as you say, it, things weren't. I guess 
things progressed to the end of the season, no great, you know, mm-hmm. uh, he didn't go going into that, that, that was uh, how things were going to turn out. But no, mm-hmm. it, was, it was, as I say, I, you, you can't turn the clock back, whatever you do, but I certainly mm-hmm. wouldn't want to turn the clock back and, and change anything about that, that, that particular goal. I think, Callum, we would probably celebrate in a similar fashion if we did at that end. Yeah, basically celebrating as if all as, as we all would have, so fair yeah. play. <laughs> um, you sort of mentioned, alluded to the fact that maybe the season didn't go exactly how you'd hoped. There was a couple of cup disappointments and things, but there was also centenary games against Southampton and Hamburg. And then you did score against Dungeon United on the last day season at Tardyce as well. How did you find all that for yourself personally? I think we won 2-0 that game, didn't we? The mm, last yeah. Game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, I think it was another running shot. I think it was a shot with a left foot, but I'm pretty sure the keeper threw it in, if I remember right. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I, listen, it was, a, it was a wee bit of change in my life then. You know, the fact is that we'd moved up. The first time we'd had, ever had to move away from Kirkcaldy, had mm-hmm. to come it went to a new area. You know, we, we obviously came up, we bought out in Balmedy, so we're moving house. Uh and then it was nice in the summer because in the summer you got away. I could spend a wee bit of time back down in Kirkcaldy and, and obviously you're getting yourself ready for the, the season after. Uh, regards to the centenary games, they meant nothing to us. They were just mm-hmm. another game. You know, we played Hamburg on a, a bleak treat Tuesday night or something and mm-hmm. it was happened was the same. So uh, they, they weren't the, uh, I hate to dampen what you're maybe trying to get. They, they weren't the nothing. They were, you know, it was a, we played Liverpool as well. Liverpool was probably mm-hmm. more, you know, the Liverpool. I, I, I believe Liverpool was in the pre-season the next it year. It was, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I had been out. I think I'd got injured. <laughs> I, I think I'd got injured against Peterhead in one mm-hmm. of the pre-season games. I think I'd done Mahami, and then we actually went down to Bradford and we played in a tournament in Bradford, yeah. mm-hmm. and then we'd come back up. If I remember right, the uh, the Liverpool game was on a Saturday. We played on a Saturday. And I think it was one of my first. I think it was my first game back for injury, mm, mm. so it was it was good for me to get get involved in that game, you know, and then get some minutes under my belt before the season was due to reconvene. Yeah, and and and, and speaking of that that Liverpool game, um, new signing David Drillich gave us the lead after after two minutes. Um, and I was thinking, oh, here we go, we found a striker. But how wrong was I about the season ahead? But do you remember that game for the the incident with the flare? I was telling Callum before you came on the flare that came over the Merkland stand and bounced hilarious. up into the Merkland. Absolutely hilarious. So, it, and, and go back just a wee bit. I, I was with you. I thought we'd found a striker in David's <laughs> today, but I was wrong as well. So you weren't the <laughs> but good man. Big David was a typical Aussie that had a lot of belief in himself. I'll put that mm. way. That was probably the best way to describe him. Uh, it was. It, you're right, we scored after a minute and you're thinking about all we've done is we woke up, we obviously woke Liverpool up uh-huh. and they changed their team at half time and, you know, they brought on the likes of Gerard and that, I think, rather mm-hmm. than... And if, if I remember right, I think I was still on at the time. I think it flew in my head. And if you watch, if you watch Michael Hart, and I don't... You maybe need to cut this out because I'm going to swear, but Michael Hart absolutely shot himself. <laughs> and, and, and I swear that... <laughs> You know, as you say, it got fired for the graveyard. That could have been, you know, if that had hit somebody in the stand, you could have that could have killed. I think the, the boy got the jail, did he? No, I think he got. I, I think I he kind of I kind of mind what happened to him, but I just remember because I was in I, my season ticket at the time was just next to the tunnel in the main stand, and, and that was I. It was just up above there, almost where the control room was. It was about where it landed. It was. Yeah. It's incredible yeah. how far it travelled. If you can get any footage of it, watch Michael Hart. It's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to search on YouTube now for it. Yeah, big brave Michael. So, yeah. Mm. It was, uh, uh, but again, we, we ended up getting beat 5-1. Uh, yeah. Again, it was a pre-season game. We used it as a pre-season game. And, and it was, uh, you know, but also, when I say we didn't think much of the Southampton game and the and the uh, Hamburg game, <laughs> it was nice to play Liverpool. Uh, mm. There was a bit of steam and prestige about playing them, mm-hmm. uh, so that was that was a good way. Unfortunately, and it, it, it probably it, it gave us a, a a good run about in pre season because we, we certainly need that. Mm-hmm. And you know the season in general, like I said, it didn't pan out the way we we wanted to. We're finishing eleventh and not keeping a clean sheet until December in the league, which was a, a three 0 win away at Park Thistle. Um, just in general, though, how did you feel that that season was for you? 
it's hard to say, you know, I, I'm a team player, so I I, I I like being judged on our results as a team. I, I was it's never one that, I was never one that thought I'd done well and the rest you were were, were rubbish. <laughs> Basically, yeah. A few disappointing things happened through the season. We we, we never I were we were we were we weren't great. Uh we lost to Livingston in the Scottish Cup. That mm-hmm. I got a bad injury in the first. I think it was the first game. Me and Martin Andrew, Andrews, one of my best pals, we went for the taco and where he caught me, it gave me the worst hematoma and and basically in my my arse, the buttock and and red right down the back of my leg and I was out for weeks because they couldn't get it. it was that deep uh, and I was dying to come back and play and they said in the quarter final I could I hadn't even trained for weeks and I said to them look give me a jag I'll play. And I remember walking with Scott Booth and saying the same him and Booth wasn't prepared to do it. And the club wouldn't let me play. And we got we lost one 0 down there and I think mm-hmm. Thursday night or something like that. I think it was uh, live right. early and mm-hmm. it probably summed the season up. It was it was just it was so disappointing because again I, there was there wasn't a bunch of fans that would have been better than something huge and achievable for you. only need to look at I was jealous of the boys that won that trophy in two thousand and 13 or 14 at, mm-hmm. at Parkhead I came back for Saudi I was working in Saudi in the time I came back for the final you know and mm-hmm. just 40 or thousand Aberdeen fans there I just thought I'd have loved that to be me you know I'd, yeah. uh, I, I don't think the guys will ever realise how much how big that was mm-hmm. um, but no it was disappointing it was disappointing then that basically you know the manager cost, him, cost himself the job with certain things but he cost him his job as well with the, the, way, we, the way we played that season Mm-hmm. One highlight of the season, however, was though uh, beating Celtic up ahead, and that man David Zrilic did pop up once again, 98th minute. I believe he went off injured in that game, but it must have been some experience and perhaps the celebrations after the game as well. How did you find that? I changed the game, didn't I? You know, that's what I <laughs> didn't realise. I, I changed <laughs> the game. I went, I went, I went off at one 0 down, and we won two one. So I actually, again, you know, true stories that, like. We went one on doing it. Celtic had, I think Celtic went 77 games unbeaten at home. Uh, I think, was that that not the, yeah, that I was, said, the, that was the, um, yeah, that was the one that ended the 77 yeah. unbeaten, yeah. 77 Before. unbeaten games, Barcelona, Liverpool, everybody, and I swear that we turned up with a pub team. We turned up with an absolute pub team. We are, we are a gang of Aberdeen strips, that's what we were. We were lambs to the slaughter because we were struggling that season anyway. He, he threw in Richie Butler, he threw in Craig Higgins. I mm-hmm. think Scott Muirhead, Scott Morrison might have played. You know, yeah, what Scott, was... Scott Mo- um, Morrison started, Higgins started, Muirhead started. Because I was reading the article today and it was the first time we'd won there in 11 years. And it was Crazy. there was five teenagers in the starting lineup. So, like you said, Richie Butler. To the floor. Aye, Richie Butler. Kev, Kev Rukovic, I think, played at mm-hmm. centre back. So, you know, it was Marcel, Peanut, Marcus, I think, in midfield, yeah. Zadrovic, and I think it was Clarky or something like that that played as well, maybe. But Foster. Foster, there you go, Ricky mm-hmm. Foster. So the truth is we had we had no chance, absolutely no yeah. chance. And we go 1-0 down after maybe 15, 20 minutes, Henrik scores, and then Mark Half goes, and then I'm thinking, I need to play on. I'm the most experienced player we've got here, I need to play on. Mm-hmm. And I just couldn't, when your calf goes, your calf goes. So I, I came off and he stuck on Brian Prunty for he me. Did, yeah. And as they say, Prunty gets the equaliser and Zadrovic gets the winner. So I'm taking all the credit. I think <laughs> I the game because we were on for a 9 or 10 nil hammer, which had happened previously, and we ended up winning 2 1. So it was a great night. You, you asked Callum about celebrations, there was none. We went up the stairs, we went in the players' lounge, we had a bite to eat, and we, Neil Lennon handed us some beer for the bus to head back up the road. Lenny was brilliant. You know, there he goes. And we get on the bus and we get it taken off the bus and we weren't allowed to drink because Stevie's issues and problems. Mm. So we mm. travelled all the way back up to Aberdeen, Tito. Whereas the next year, we certainly mm. didn't come back up the road Tito after we won uh, 3-2. Uh, I was going to ask, was that was that a better victory? You know, that, that 3-2, um, your good friend Budgie there grabbing the winner? That was a real victory because it was a real game of football. We're up... We're, it was backs against the wall with the two one victory and, and you know I think Celtic had maybe won the league or whatever it was and it was a but when we 
we went the next season, it was at the start of the season, or it was, you know, it was probably about October, September, yeah, October, October. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and, and that just felt like, I don't know if, I don't know if that makes sense, but it feel like, felt like a real victory. It felt mm-hmm. like we were in a real game and 2 0 up after eight minutes or whatever it was, you know, yeah. I think it does six, mark in. Six minutes in the Pasconelli, the famous celebration that Pasconelli. many of my friends like enjoy doing. Pasconelli, I played, I played well in the Livingston and then he came up and Again, one that probably Aberdeen fans would never uh, really expected, but again, just something different for the two Jimmies that he wanted in. And Celtic then come back to two all with Big John and got two goals for Celtic, and then, but it was still a ding dong. It was still, you know, it wasn't like we we're really defending. And then, as you say, we were we clear the ball up. Clarkie boots it up the park. We Budgie takes his three best touches in Aberdeen, and it was just brilliant. You see your reaction again. Talk about Aberdeen had a great wee fan content you know a contingent doing that night and mm-hmm. a Wednesday night yeah and we, we celebrated doing in that corner and then we celebrated that you know the final whistle went there after and we all went back down and I threw my strip into the crowd I think a few of us did and then the time I got into the dress room the police were at the door they were, wanting to, they were, they were going to charge me for inciting a riot <laughs> uh, and that, that goes on street Going to charge me. Well, you see the the camera angle when um, Budgie's running towards the crowd. The linesman's probably the first person he meets because he's stopping him, and the police are charging out as well. So it doesn't even surprise me. No, I mean, that was goes on his truth, and, and it was like, and, and the the reason being it was that they were trying to say that a young kid got trampled on when they were fighting for my strip. I was like, look, mate, there's no chance I'm throwing my strip back at me and <laughs> fight for it. And it's quite funny because I, the the guy that got my strip about a week and a half later, he says he caught it, he caught, he caught it clean mm-hmm. and he, and he's, there was nothing like that, you know, and it was just amazing that, yeah, we came up the road uh, with a, a good, a good going out on the way back up the road and we, then we, but unfortunately we went down on the Sunday and we got hammered at Ibrox, so, mm-hmm. but, you know, it was a Jimmy Calder thought process when you went 2-0 down, he was going for it and, you know, we never looked into results. We I think we got beat five 0 that day at Ibrox, and I think it was because Jimmy would accept a five 0 Mirna would accept a two 0 He mm-hmm. wanted Jimmy to get back into the game, you know. But yeah, that was uh, that was a good night, a very good uh, night. I was in a I was in a huff that night because I wasn't allowed to go. I was still at school at the time, so I wasn't allowed to go down to the midweeks in Glasgow. So um, I said I was going to my bed and I stuck North Sound on and I just put the volume down really low and then it was it became very apparent what I was doing in the 90th <laughs> minute when John Stewart stuck in that winner. I was running around the room celebrating. So. It was a, yeah, it was a great goal. Brown for me, bud. And again, you know, Aberdeen fans probably know, but we bud, he was where he was born and brought up. He was a huge Rangers man. Huge, 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 huge Rangers man, we bud, yeah. And uh, so probably more fitting for him that he, he scored that goal. Don't get me wrong, that's the thing what Aberdeen fans need to realise. When we all played for Aberdeen, we're Aberdeen through and through. Mm-hmm. Just said we were at other teams before when they were growing up. And that's what happens. It's like guys that are born and brought, in Aber- brought up in Aberdeen, Aberdeen fans. You know, if you come from somewhere else in the country, times you support other teams. Unfortunately for, unfortunately for certain players, it's hard because Aberdeen fans don't tend to like the ones that support a, a certain team. So, yeah. <laughs> They'll include it, obviously. <laughs> yeah, there's true. certainly seen examples of that in, in, in recent weeks in the in the transfer market. Mm. It's disappointing, you know. I, I, and I, you know, I, I'm I'm quite lucky. I just say it as it is. I, I think what I get disappointed in is the fact that when Sir Alex Ferguson had that fantastic team in the '80s, they hated everybody. It didn't matter if it was Albion Rovers, mm-hmm. if it was, if it was Elgin City, they hated them. Yeah feel that we've got to a stage now because of recent history and what's happened that Aberdeen fans seem to really detest Rangers or Sevco or the new Rangers or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, everybody else tends to get a wee bit of free ride. Now, I think that disappoints because I'd like Aberdeen to get, get back to we hate everybody. You yeah, know? Absolutely. And and, 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 and I think I think a lot of the real fans will admit no, it isn't mere just Rangers. A lot of the other ones will say, no, no, we do hate everybody but you, you think do we? You know, and I, I would, I, I, I'd like that because I think it gets through the players as well. Mm. I love playing in the Rangers games because you knew, it, maybe it's bad being a pro and saying this, but you felt the hatred, you wanted to go out and win it for the fans. Mm. Yeah, there was a play, then you could hear the rustling of sweetie papers in somebody's mm-hmm. pocket because 
there was just nothing. You know, and I, and I think I think that's certainly something that we need to get back to. We need to get back to detesting everybody and just loving our own. So we'll no, see. A- that. Absolutely, I think I there's know. definitely going to be listeners. Um, I can name a few, um, that will be absolutely loving what you're saying there, Stephen. I think I totally agree. I think it's exactly the mentality because it's a good point you make about the so-called, and again, no disrespect to the so-called lesser teams when we come up against them, the, the mentality is not there and the hatred that, that is brought upon Rangers games inspires, well, should inspire um, the players and, and help them. And I think we've obviously seen that this season with the fans not being there, but, but Calm, I'm sure you'll agree. It's certainly a mentality that we would love to see at the cl- return to the club. Yeah, I want a siege mentality. Just us versus everyone. Then that's how you create it, that sort of winning mentality, I suppose. Because it's you versus them. It used to be it felt more as well when we used to go to Dundee, you know, where it be, you know, even more even Dundee and, and United. And I, I think I think a lot of stuff I, if I remember right, because it's been said a lot of times, I think the hatred there's because the police are just an absolute disgrace when yeah. you go in and they seem to arrest all and sundry for next to nothing. So mm-hmm. but no, I, I, listen, I'm 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 no having a go at Aberdeen fans, mm-hmm. but it just no. that it just feels that, you know, shouldn't you need to come out just four times a season? You know, mm-hmm. but as I say, Fer- Fergie had Aberdeen. I remember I speak to Johnny Hewitt, you know, and Johnny would tell us that Fergie had Fergie would br- make something up about every team they played against, just so the players hated them going into that game. You Did know, you ever have that under any of your managers? Leash was pretty good at it. It wasn't so much the hate thing, but Leash just always had a thing that he would make up that foot would were jealous of years at, at, at Livingston and. You know, and Leash used to he, he go he got into a way where he used to say to us, "All you were going to do is uh, get out there, scalp their ass, put them back on their bus, and get them up the road to the traffic lights, and away they go." And it was amazing. That was used to be one of the last things he used to say before we went and played. And you, it was something that you're like, "I can son, you're right, Leash. Let's get this game won, mm-hmm. and, and let's get them away from our stadium." And you know, and and, and Leash was good at that. You know, but probably not so much. And, and but as a player. All players are different. You build yourself up for for any and every game, you know. So mm-hmm. you, you shouldn't need the fans, but it does it when there's an atmosphere, and you know, in the ground. Mm-hmm. That's actually interesting. You mentioned that about Jim Leishman. Like, even if there wasn't anything, then he would make it up because that's something like Michael Jordan used to do. I don't really like basketball or whatever, but I've watched the Last Dance documentary on Netflix, and he says. Like that's how he got through games. Like if there wasn't anything, he would just make something up in his head to get into that sort of psyche that it has to. We have to. We need to put them in their place, kind of thing. So it's just yeah. interesting. No, it, it, listen, it's, it's easy said, and it's you know, but it, it, it does. It, it helps you. You know, you siege mentality. You mentioned there. You know, but for me, for me, see, I was one of the world's worst. I, I, again, I'd like to think that I was hated by fans of the opposition teams but love when I come to be playing for their club because I just wanted to win I would have mm-hmm. kicked my money for 90 odd minutes just to make sure that we won it didn't happen all the time but for me I thought that yeah if you gave your all I was got my mantra and my thought process was I was if you give 110% no matter how bad you are how shite you are that day the fans will allow it because you've given you've given it, right. yeah. they can see that Mm-hmm. And you know, and I, and I, and again, I only played seventy times for Aberdeen, and for some reason, I'm, I'm held in quite high esteem. And I think that's because fans seen that I was just actually one of them, but we are strip on. You know that. And I think as well, not only that, but you've just hit the nail on the head as well there, because you gave your all week in, week out, and it didn't matter if we were playing Rangers. It was every week. There was always the effort. And 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 that's what us, us as fans like to see. We don't like just seeing you you raising your game one week and then shirking the responsibility the next. There was there was always that that commitment to the jersey. And for me, you know, I, I again, I used to talk to myself. I used to turn around in the dressing room just before I went out. And I used to face the wall, and I just used to say things like, first pass, make it easy, keep it easy." And the last thing I used to say to myself is. Nobody can stop you working hard. Nobody can stop you working hard. Nobody can stop you working hard. And I'd go out because if I was playing against somebody that's six foot two, he's probably going to beat me in the air. If I was mm-hmm. playing against somebody that's slightly quicker than me, he's maybe going to beat me on the ground. But 
I might give the ball away, I might do the but what they couldn't do is they couldn't stop me working hard. Mm-hmm. And I just always found that if I work hard in the end, you grind people down. You yeah. get to people, you know, and, and and what I'd like to think is even before you went out, they'd be looking at the team shoot going, ah, Tosh is playing. He'll, he'll just be in a boot us all day and he'll be working and hurrying. And, and, and you know, you, you, again, I'd like to think my game was a wee bit more than that, but I, I made sure that it was the first thing and the, the, the thing that I'd done every single time. Mm-hmm. And I just felt if I gave that, you cheated fans. I, I cheated fans at times. I cheated Aberdeen fans at times in the sense that Maybe I knew the ball was going to go, but I thought, well, as long as I chase it, I'm, the fans are going to be on. But I'd done that so the fans would be, come on, hi, come on, let's go. Mm. You know, mm. so when I say I cheated them, I didn't mean in general, but what I mean is like, I probably knew that I couldn't get to a ball, but I thought, well, as long as I try, they'll bat me. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and, and obviously that's what happened. And, and then, you know, obviously then it comes to a stage in my life where I decided that it was the right time to move on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You've mentioned just before you got into that. Mentioned a couple of times, uh, Jimmy Calderwood there. What was sort of his arrival like for you? And I suppose equally, maybe Pele's departure as well. I was in Portugal when Pele went. I think with Russell, myself and Russell, and uh, their wives and uh, kids were away to Portugal because uh, I remember phoning the two of us phoning Pele and just apologising basically. Mm. Uh, I think we were under the impression we thought we all thought it was going to be Eric Black that was going to get the job uh, okay. and look forward to that Eric you know Aberdeen legend and, and I mm-hmm. think cut his teeth at Motherwell about the time and uh, but Jimmy came out Jimmy was brilliant Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy opened my eyes to so much Jimmy was fantastic and you know when they appointed him uh, he, he came in that first day I remember him coming in that first day of training he'd obviously been in the, on the beach in uh, San Ponza for about three months and he was and he was great he came in, he explained to us what his expectations were, what his demands were going to be. And it's something that I loved. I loved demands being put onto us and expectations. And, you know, it was up to us then to, to try and match them. Uh, but no, it was, it was a great appointment for the football club. Yeah, as, as Richie Byrne um, said in our in our first player interview, he always commented on, it, <coughs> on his tan, but he also said similar that Jimmy was kind of the, a manager that you would feel like running through brick walls for it. and as you as a player that probably had that mentality that must have been good for you I, I, again I, I, Richie maybe had to run through brick walls because he couldn't play again you know so but, uh, but for us I like the fact no, I agree and I disagree I agree the fact that he, he, he put demands on you and expectations mm-hmm. you know he was he was probably in there and he was he, he dragged Aberdeen back to where they are just now yeah. In the centre of it was him that demanded Aberdeen shouldn't be eleventh in the league. Aberdeen shouldn't be tenth in the league. Mm-hmm. Aberdeen need to be top half, if no third. Mm-hmm. You know, fans might be saying, "Well, why is he not saying win the league?" You've got to be realistic as well. But his demands were. He used to. Do, he, we were away in Holland, and he had this on a room, and he put the fixtures up, and we had to write down exactly how many points we thought we'd get in a quarter, where we thought mm-hmm. we we're going to get the points. And then he actually looked at them all. He took everybody's. You all had to fill it in. He took everybody's. And then he came in with where he thought we were going to be. And then he, you know, and he, I think he just wanted these players to maybe think a wee bit much like managers and get a wee bit mentality like that on board. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and he, he always does a thing. He, he comes in on a Monday morning and he gets over in the dressing room and he'll say, right, Saturday's game. We want to now played well with the first half, knocked the ball about well, great goal was scored. Second half, I thought we started a bit slack, blah, 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 blah. Right, Glenn, what did you think? And I remember the first time we'd done it, we were now, we were unaware. And I remember, it, I think he went to Kevin McNaughton, and Kevin McNaughton hardly ever used to say a word, and Kevin McNaughton turned around and said something like, I think the same as you, Gaffer. And it, but he never just picked the players that played, he picked boys that were sitting, and what he wanted was to, people, to see if people were engaging and thinking the same way as him. And uh, or not the same way as him. He wanted us all to have a voice because what you've got to comprehend is a manager can get tired. I never understand a manager that's shouting after forty minutes, uh, forty seconds of a game. You mm-hmm. get your tactics, you go. I guess once you go over the white lines, a manager can't do very much. Mm-hmm. You know, you you know, you've done your bit. You hope the players uh, carry your your actions out. But no, Jimmy was Jimmy was great. He, he you know he was great. It was training was fantastic. Uh, a right intensity, 
he wanted, to, you know, he wanted to play in a certain way, and and I and I think he was the first one that actually got Aberdeen fans probably back into the stadium and bums mm-hmm. on seats and bums off seats because there was a wee bit of excitement about the place. Mm-hmm. Definitely, I, it, it was a kind of a style that was grinding out results, and like you said, he was bringing us back to where we wanted to be, and obviously we had the memorable European run and, and obviously like we, we said in previous episodes for, for players that have worked under Jimmy we obviously hope he's doing well given his current um, illness it's it's not nice to see so we do hope yeah. and wish him a speedy recovery in that Yeah I'm not so sure what type of recovery there is but yeah it's not very nice when someone like that happens of, to be honest never heard or seen of, of Jimmy I, I, I don't know if he's I, 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 I don't know if he's went to ground basically because of the illness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's obviously our thoughts are our thoughts are with him. Definitely. And um, before you before you left Aberdeen, um, I want to ask you about one of your last goals that you scored for the club. Um, a home game against Dungeon United, you scored the afternoon of your son's birth, I believe it was. That's right. I was. Uh, yeah, Jordan was born twenty seventh of November two thousand and four. So as you say, my last game, I'd went to, trained on the Friday, obviously knew that my, my wife Stephanie was uh, heavily pregnant and due to give birth any time. Mm-hmm. So uh, went home to Balmedy uh, on the, the Friday, uh, got myself prepared for the game. My mum and my sister had actually come up for the game. Uh, they were staying with us and Steph said to me, probably about half ten, at night, I'd went to my upstairs to my bed, left the woman down the stairs. Uh, she came upstairs and basically said that she felt like she was going into labour. And because it was her second child, because obviously we'd already had Morgan, my, my daughter, uh, basically I'd said to Steph, well, wake me up when you are in labour, I've got a game to prepare for. <laughs> I went to sleep, I went back to sleep and she woke me up about five o'clock in the morning and basically said, look, I think we need to go to the hospital. So, obviously... Being an Aberdeen player at the time, I thought, wait a minute, I can't have anybody see me like that. So I went and had a shower, a cup of tea, and then, then went in and thought through. Took her out the hospital, got her settled in, went and got some magazines for the wee shop across the road. And yeah, Jordan, well, we expected to be in there for a period of time based on how Morgan was born. Went in at the back of six. Jordan was born at 11 minutes past 10 in the morning. Uh, so came at the hospital, phone. <laughs> Obviously, phoned people, went went back to Balmedy, showered again, cut the bacon rolls, cut the tea back in the hospital, uh, all suited and booted because I'd spoke to Jimmy and Jimmy had said, well, you're playing, it's up to you. If you want to, I fully understand. Uh, and, but Stephanie had said to me, look, she she was knackered. She was just going to sleep in the afternoon anyway. As, mm-hmm. as a, and so was my, my son. So, yeah, went and played and Strange, you know, it's just how it's, it was meant to be. And we won one now. I scored the goal. It was probably one of a really nice goal as well, you know. And mm. I went back, I came off after about 60 minutes. I think the adrenaline had stopped and I was <laughs> done in. And yeah, went and went back to the hospital that night and obviously told the wee one that, no, he never knew, but told him that mm. I scored a goal for him on the day he was born. And mm. quite funny that my, my daughter Morgan wanted to know as to why I didn't score a goal for her. <laughs> Was born so yeah. My last goal for Aberdeen. I played that. I think I played the next week, and I think mm. I got wee injury, and that was basically me out for a period of time, and then came back into the team. Uh, played against Arbroath in the Scottish Cup. I don't know if I played any other games after that, and then uh, I was obviously then I left, went to Gretna, mm. and uh, talking of Gretna. That was a pretty mad couple of seasons. Obviously, you got to the Scottish Cup final and all that good stuff. How did it come about and how was that whole experience? I'd been offered... Jimmy wanted to give me a new deal. So my contract was coming out in the summer and I went and spoke... Jimmy had offered... wanted me to get a two-year deal. So at the time at Aberdeen, you got your basic wage and you got appearance money. And after you played so many games, your appearance money went up. Mm. And then I think it was every 20 games or something like that. And obviously... I'd played, six, I'd played over 60 games, so it went up three times. And it wasn't a huge amount, but it went up, I think it was £100, 100 pound every 20 games it went up. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember going up to speak to Willie Miller. Uh, Willie was obviously director of football, and I went up there with intentions of a two-year deal. But I didn't even want a wage rise, the same money I was on, uh, and I'd been happy. And I came out of that meeting with a one-year deal. Uh, 
I think my wages were remaining the same, but he was taking four hundred pound a week or four hundred pound a game appearance money off me, uh, and basically. <laughs> I told Willie, that's not going to happen. I'd earned that money, you know. Mm -hmm. I went mm -hmm. back and spoke to Jimmy. Uh, and the reason I wanted a two-year deal at the time was I, I realised my age, but my daughter was about to start school at Balmeri, mm -hmm. primary one, and I just didn't want to be tied to a club for a year because, again, logistically, if you're signed with Aberdeen, where do you go? It's not like you can go and sign for another club, you know, if it didn't work out after a year, so... I wanted the two-year deal just to give me and Steph that wee bit of security for a couple of years that we knew that Morgan would get a couple of years in the same school mm -hmm. at the very least before I probably realised that I was either going to sign for a, a Peterhead or something like that and maybe because Jimmy had wanted me to take the under-14s okay. he, he wanted me to start again the coach but now Willie Willie in all his wisdom decided that a one-year deal and less money and I say to him look and we all knew Barry Nicholson was coming in. I said, look, Barry Nicholson's going to take my place, but I'm not going to give him £400 of my money to pay <laughs> you. You know, and I says, because I get there's a wage structure, but I'd earned that money. Mm -hmm. so, no, I, 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 I knew that Gretna were interested. Uh, and Gretna offered me a three and a half year deal. And, uh, it, you know, everybody's got this opinion that, and I'll tell the truth, everybody's got this opinion that I went for the, I was on uh, the same wages I, I dropped about 800 quid a week uh, between wages and appearance money. I dropped about 800. Mm -hmm. And our book will be going rubbish, but it was true. But it was because I knew for three and a half years, don't get me wrong, it was still, I was still in Premier League wages uh, playing in the third division. Mm -hmm. The appearance money was in, was nothing like, or bonus monies, etc. was nothing like. We were on a £1,000 a win at Aberdeen at the time, I think. At Grenton, they were on 250, so that told a story. So... <laughs> But it was just the security. I wanted to go. I wanted my daughter to be in a school for a period of time and, and I didn't even want us worrying that in a year's time we, we maybe had to up sticks and try and find another club and stuff. So that was the only reason I, only reason I left. If I'd got a two-year deal, I actually think if I'd got a two-year deal, I, I might have still been at the football club yet in some capacity. But mm. it wasn't to be. And that happens in football. You know, Willie, Willie was doing what he thought was right for the football club. I was doing what I thought was right for my, my family. Uh, mm. And I moved on. I went to, as you say, I went to, I went to Gretna, and I realised after about two minutes, what the fuck have you done? So, yeah, it must have been must have been a bit of a roller coaster. That obviously on the field things are going well, promotions and things, but off the field it's a bit bit wild. How did that sort of the contrast between what was going on on the field and off the field feel to you? I didn't really know. I saw the field wasn't a bad to start with. You know, mm. it was obviously Brooks was fantastic. The, the chairman the, or the owner was fantastic. The manager was an absolute pillock. You know, I've never met so much. A, well, he was a fool, and then eventually brought in a director of football who I didn't think there could be as much a fool than the manager. But it turns out there was, and so with a director of football that was an absolute imbecile, uh, and a manager that had no backbone. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, the man, if the manager had the backbone. He probably could have, we didn't need the director of football because the truth be told, we were winning everything. Anything that was put in front of us, we were beating anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and then so everything was everything was great for the first two and a half years, in fact, three years. And then, uh, no, would there be two and a half? So, I played the uh, two for a couple of years. First couple of years was great. I was the highest earner, wages kept on going up, etc., etc., etc. And then we got to the first division after the Scottish Cup final. As you say, we're in the first division. We're, we're leading it. I've got 18 months left on my contract. I remember we beat St Johnson 2-0 to go about 12 points clear. And we, we flew over across we flew across to Dublin at the, after the game because we were having our Christmas due. And uh, honestly, you wouldn't believe half the stories. But like, so we flew to Dublin and we were chaperoned by Steve Collins, the boxer, his brothers. They chaperoned us. Mm. And we were getting into clubs at Premier League clubs we had to stand in a queue to try and wait and get in. And there was us with Gretna again. And honestly, it was brilliant. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't make it up. And then, I, so when I was across the air, one of Steve's brothers, Roddy Collins, was very friendly with the chairman. And Roddy told me that Brooks, Brooks loves you. Kenny wants, he wants to see you long term at the football club. I would go and see about a, a year's extension on your contract. I came back and I spoke to the manager and the manager was like, this was a... We, Spoke to him on a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, look, hadn't thought about that, but leave that with me. We got beat 4-2 by Airdrie on the Saturday. 
Mm-hmm. I think I think Derek Townsley got sent off after about ten minutes, so we we're done to ten men. Got beat four two. Played the ninety minutes. Came in on the Monday. Went to training. Got put at training on the Monday. Be told that the manager wants to speak to you back at the ground. Everyone was like, oh, oh you're obviously got your year's contract. I'd scored, I think I'd scored nine or ten goals in the first three months of the season. It was absolutely flying. <laughs> went to the went to the ground that spent me a year's contract and or, or an additional year's contract took the 18 I had left, 18 months I'd left. And then to be told that I'd seen him when I walked into his room and he was ashen, ashen faced. He was white, sorry, ashen faced. And I was like, no, there's something wrong here. And he basically said, eh, we've decided that. We can, we're going to let you go, and mm-hmm. I was like, uh, and I started laughing. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. "What?" He says, "I would go let you go." I says, "Well, you know, I've got eighteen months left on what was a lucrative contract." I mm-hmm. says, "Nobody else is going to give me the money you are giving me." Mm-hmm. He says, oh, "Don't worry about that. We'll sort, we'll sort, sort your money out." And he says, and, he's, and I said, I think I said, "I'll never forget." I said, "Well, look, till I've got another club, nothing changes for me. I'm still, mm-hmm. still training. I'm still available." And he went, and I'll never. And this is why I think the man's a pilot. He actually said to me, yeah, we appreciate that. No, nothing will change. That was a Monday. Mm-hmm. I went in at training on a Tuesday. We are doing a bit of running because we're off Wednesday. So I went in and the director of football, that, this boy Mick Wadsworth, who's an even bigger clown, asked to speak to me after it, after training. So I spoke to him. And he says, so what are you looking for? I says, every single penny. I says, I've no ask to leave. I says, I'm going to eat up sticks and move my family, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. And he, mm-hmm. he just says, oh, we'll see about that. And I went into training on Thursday and I was told to do the warm-up with the first team and then I was told to go and train with the kids. And I'd done the same on the Friday and then they told me to take Monday off and then they didn't want me at the game on the Saturday for some reason. And and it just it kept on going like that. So I basically, they, they didn't make me train with the kids. They allowed me to come in every day. It was hilarious. I used to get to come in. We all had one AstroTurf pitch, so the kids used to train for nine to half ten. Mm-hmm. and we used to train for sort of for 10 to half 11, 12 but mm-hmm. we would do our warm up around the outside and then when the kids come off at half 10 so I used to do the warm up at 10 o'clock for about 15 minutes get pulled to, to go and train with the kids for the next 15 minutes and then up with me finished because I didn't get to train with the first team so they were paying me every single pay and they kept me waiting they, I spoke to about 9 or 10 teams had good offers on the table between myself and the ex-wife, we decided to go with Queen of the South because it, we were staying in Dumfries and we didn't need to move. Mm-hmm. You know, they offered they offered me a really good deal for basically being part time. Uh, again, it was going to cater for my kids' schooling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I told, I basically told Gretna, right, I've sorted it out. Uh, we just need to sort out my payoff. And they kept me waiting to the day before the transfer deadline at the end of January, all the way for the, I think it was up for the. I think it was about the 12th of December they pulled me. So they kept me for about six or seven weeks and mm. I had to go down to Brooks's house just to see Carlisle uh, the day before the transfer deadline and he basically asked me, would you not think about staying? Because they were starting to hit the skin by that time and I was like, no. So, and he, they, they wouldn't pay me off. Wow. They, they actually gave me 750 quid a week to go and play for somebody else. That's how, that's how I'm subbed. That's how absurd it was. They were they were paying me to go and play. So I was getting my money for Queen of the South every week. Mm-hmm. And Gretna were paying me as well. And that lasted probably to about three, four weeks before my contract was due to expire. And that's when the administrators come in. But they still had signing on fees to give me. I still got paid every single penny my signing on fees. I, no. I was getting paid more to play for Queen of the South than people were getting paid to play for Gretna. That's <laughs> so, madness. Crazy. It, it, mm-hmm. it, crazy. And, and, and that happens a lot in football, you know, but mm-hmm. at the same time, no particularly then, it was just, and I went to Queen's and found my mojo again, you know, and it was it was a good wee football club. Yeah, you certainly found your mojo uh, at Queen's. Um, I suppose it'd be rude not to ask you about the, well, I don't know how you feel about it, um, probably quite happy, but for, for me, still probably a game I can never forget, the infamous semi-final against Aberdeen. What was it like the game in general, but also coming up against your former club, a club that you you know you kind of hold dear to your heart at the time? I was probably one of the first times I probably was the first time I played against Aberdeen again. You know, but mm-hmm. uh, I played enough against enough ex teams to you, you just accept that you move on. Once you leave a football club, you've left the football club. But for me, you know, and, and to be honest, Aberdeen were great with me because when I was when I first went to Gretna mm-hmm. uh, from Aberdeen. 
Gretna were great to start with Gretna because I still obviously had my house up in Balmedy and we had to sell it before all the fan would come down I used to play on a Saturday then I used to train with Aberdeen on a Monday and a Tuesday okay. and then I used to travel down on a Wednesday train with Gretna Thursday, Friday play Saturday so mm. and I always remember Jimmy Calderwood when I first went in I was all, I thought I'd train with the kids no I, I trained with the first team all the time still at Aberdeen oh, okay. uh, so yeah a club that I held dear but going to the Queen of the South and we'd been playing well you know we we were we were the we were like Inverness Cali when Pelly was there. We only had about eighteen players, mm-hmm. and you probably had nine players that were I was going to play, and out the other nine, two would obviously start, but they would, you know depend on injuries. Mm-hmm. But you know we probably had three boys out that eighteen that were never going to play, and you had about your squad of fourteen, fifteen that definitely you're going to get your eleven boys fit. So we had, we were kind of like the Inverness Cali where we had a right good unit, you know. Uh, and with a lot of experienced players at the football club, maybe people would say experience, experience with old, but we felt experienced. And I remember we watched Aberdeen play. I've told this story before. We watched Aberdeen play Falkirk on the Monday night, and it was live on the telly. Mm-hmm. And Aberdeen won one now. I think Chris Maguire scored. Uh, you know, but they were they weren't they great. They, they, you know, they, uh, it wasn't it was in the Premier League, but it wasn't a good Falkirk team. And they yeah. weren't, they weren't great. And we, I remember going into training on the Tuesday and Chizzy, Gordon Chisholm coming to the dress room, uh, change room where we were, before we went to training. And he basically just said to us, guys, if you can't, if you can't beat this Aberdeen team, or, or listen, if you can't beat, basically you'll never get a better chance mm-hmm. than beating an Aberdeen team. And we went, I remember we trained well all week and we went to, obviously, Hamden on the Saturday. Uh, and it was, let's be honest, it was our cup final. So we had nothing to lose. You know, our fans were there as their cup final our fans were probably expecting us to put up a performance but potentially lose and and, and that's but I remember <coughs> excuse me I remember being in the tunnel before it before we went to Saturday quarter past 12 kick off 20 odd thousand there you know vast majority of maybe 8,000 Queen of the South 13, mm-hmm. 14,000 Aberdeen fans yeah. and I just remember and I looked across at the Aberdeen players and I remember in the tunnel, I remember, as I say, four or five of us saying, come on, let's go, come on. And not a, not a peep for them. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I just remember the game starting and, and you know, listen, it, it, Carla mentioned basketball earlier. This was fitting for a basketball match then. You know, <laughs> you score, we score, you score, we mm. score. And I honestly yeah. believe, and, 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 and I'm no bigger myself up here, but I honestly believe if I had a red jersey on that day, Aberdeen would have been playing in that Scottish Cup final because there was no leadership in Aberdeen team. No, when the chips were doing, there was nobody pulling each other by the scruff of the, 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 the neck, the, you mm-hmm. know, getting by somebody by the throat and saying, hey, you, come on. You know, and there was just nothing. Absolutely yeah. nothing at all. And, and whereas we had that in abundance, we had, we lost three goals and every time we lost a goal, Marcel, McFarland, but we were, we had Kane the defenders. You had a go at them, you know, because mm. get your mind on the game. We never ever seen that for the Aberdeen players when no. losing goals. Well, let's see, also, like it seemed that every time we scored, you just went back up and scored right up the other end. And I don't think Aberdeen ever led in that that game. No, either. Never, no, I scored the first goal one 0 and then uh, Aunt Big Andrew, I think, got yeah. his goal. And then, if I remember right, uh, one at half time, Paul Burns two one, and then Conti again. Was it no Barry Nick or the the the? But maybe it was Constein, maybe I, I yeah. thought Barry got the second one. And then Sean, Sean O'Connor, 3-2. And then whoever for Andrew, obviously, or Barry Man. got 3-0. And then, as you say, we budget 4-3. <laughs> and it's quite funny, I, I get it, Aberdeen hit the, the post or the bar. And they were, you know, they were getting to us and that. Because yeah, I think, I remember, I think it was Sean Luca had a really good chance at 3-0. And I think I was like, if we'd scored that, would you have had the mentality to come back from from going behind? So here's my take on it. Aberdeen <laughs> fans hate me when I say this, but Aberdeen fans are deluded when they think back to that game. Absolutely deluded. Because I get said to me a million times, and I've see if we scored a fourth equaliser, we'd have won the game. And I was like, I'd say for see when you scored your first equaliser, what did we do? <laughs> and, and then I go, see when we see when you scored your second equaliser, what did we do? So mm. going back to, and, and I'm not going to go, I'm, I'm laughing about this, but our mentality was strong. Yeah. Our mentality was, well, you have scored, but guess what? We've got, and you've only then got to look at the Scottish Cup final and a month, months later, we were 2-0 mm-hmm. doing against a team that had just played in the UEFA Cup final. Yeah. 
10 days beforehand, 2 0 down against the champions. Mm-hmm. And within eight minutes of the second half, we were 2 0. Yeah. So we had, we had strong mentality. The, the, the thing about football is, when if Aberdeen had scored to go 4 3 up, but we'll never know because they never. No. And, no. And, and, and what really disappoints me is if you look at that Queen of the South team, it was a good team. Mm-hmm. It disappoints me that it's kind of. It rankles or it rankles me with that. A lot of Aberdeen fans see it as one of their damnedest defeats, and and I think I'm sure you've lost to Queens Park. Yeah, we did on I penalties. Mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I was at the semi final against Dundee United when they lost four now at Tyne Castle. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I find that a wee bit, I, I, from my perspective, because I just find mm-hmm. that a wee bit damning that a lot look upon that game because. I think we deserved the win. I think we merited it. I think, oh, we, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, we and, and I, I don't think we were a club team. I think, you know, Jamie mm-hmm. McDonald went on and played for Hearts. You know, we had mm-hmm. Eric Payton, that was at right, uh, right back. It was Ryan McCann played, we'd be at Celtic with Bob mm-hmm. Harris that went and played Chef United in the Premiership. Yeah. Stephen Gobe that played in the Premiership, scored goals at Wembley. Scored so, goals uh, against us not long ago in the Cup as well, <laughs> Stephen Gobe. <Dobie. laughs> so, so, Neil McFarlane, that was, you know, a really good uh, ex-pro with Jamie McQuilkin that had done really well. But hadn't he, the only place that Jamie really struggled was when he came up to Aberdeen. And the reason with mm-hmm. that was Jamie's missus didn't move up for Glasgow. And Jamie mm-hmm. was the time he'd come up on a Sunday, travelled in on a Tuesday, come back up on a Thursday. And so I think Jamie's body just gave up Aberdeen. But, you know, Sean O'Connor was a batter. I could go through them all, but we had a good, <laughs> we had a good team. We, did, we, did, we, were a, we were a good football team and we were probably on our day, we would have matched anybody on our day. We would never have done it over the course of a season because, as I say, we had a smaller squad. Yeah. But on our day, we were capable and, 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 and thankfully for us. And I go with Bonus with you. Aberdeen's got history. Aberdeen's got 1983. Aberdeen, mm. for Queen of the South, for Queen of the South to get that in their history, that's, I think we can give them that one. You know, I think it's mm-hmm. uh, here and again that it's never going to be done again. We, that team, we took Queen of the South, Queen of the South, into yeah, Europe. I know, it's crazy. Europe. It was just, you know, you, uh, uh, you guys have, have had 2014, but your generation before you had 83. That that generation of Queen of the South fans had had North Ireland and, and, and Denmark, and, mm. and, you know, they had that Scottish Cup final. And for me, I, I, I love that, you know, I, I, yeah. I, think, I think it's fantastic. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, it'll never be done again. No, and it's an interesting point that you know you make about the mentality. You just look at the the end of the game, the way some of the Aberdeen players trudged off, and no one wanting to take even a glimmer of responsibility. And you know, I think as well, it's interesting what you said there about the the final when you were two 0 down and took it to two all. Walter Smith a few years back said that, and. I, I, I know I'm quoting him here, so I'm not meaning it in any disrespect. That he said, had it been any other team apart from Queen of the South, they'd have probably lost that that final. You know, I, I'm assuming he meant that had it been Aberdeen they faced in the final, that they wouldn't have they wouldn't have won because they were so tired after after that UEFA Cup final. But so were we. What people didn't understand is we finished the we we'd finished our league campaign mm-hmm. and then you know we had four weeks without a game. Yeah, mm. four four weeks without a game, you know. So it was crazy because folks say, but when you're no match fit, you, we just run out of steam. We, and and again, you know, I think what what was meaning as well because we've got to remember. I think what was meaning on the day, on mm-hmm. the day, you know, because yeah. if you think about it, we've been and we've seen Aberdeen get turned over by the old firm. We've seen we've seen Aberdeen get nine by Celtic, etc. Mm-hmm. So you know, I think Aberdeen fans have said to me as well. So have the players are uh, we, we we the beat Rangers that day. A game we'll never know. We'll, yeah. ne- we'll never mm-hmm. ever, no. ever know. But I will say though, because I don't believe you would have beat Rangers, and I'll tell you why. You just couldn't have beat us in a semi because there was no character. I took the ball into the corner in the semi final about a couple of minutes to go, and I mm-hmm. held it in the corner for about 30 seconds. See if I did a red jersey on, I'd have ended that player into that. The, the, honestly, I'd have ended that player. I'd have mm-hmm. ended, that player in the ball would have ended up in the Queen of South fans. I'd have mm-hmm. taken a again. You yeah. get, you know, and I, that's why as I say I get Aberdeen's thought process I've been there but if, if my mum had a cock she'd be my dad we'll never know Come on, yeah. it's, just, it's one of these things it's like if we'd done this or we'd done that yeah. if, I pick, if I pick six different numbers in the lottery I'd be, I'd be a multi-million so yeah, 
it's, it's, I guess, and I, I, I get where we're coming from when we talk football games, but that's the beauty of it. It didn't mm-hmm. happen. What did happen is we scored four, Aberdeen scored three. In the final, Rangers scored three, we scored two. You know, mm-hmm. and I played the two Scottish Cup finals in my life and I've got two losers medals, but I was a winner. I was a winner on both occasions. We took hearts to penalty kicks. Mm-hmm. We, you know, at a second division team, we mm-hmm. took the we we took the UEFA Cup finals all the way. And by the mm-hmm. way, Rangers, Rangers were shitting ourselves. You know, when we mm-hmm. go back to all, we never had a clue. I remember just saying that saying us at half time. He says to us, "I don't care if we get beat five now. Just go and play how you've played all season. Then, then he'll then he'll like that first half define how your season's been." You know, it says, I know he's a better than that. He says, but you didn't need to prove to me. Go and prove to your parents. Go and prove to your girlfriends, your Ken, your boyfriends, whatever it would be. Go and prove to them that he's a better than that. And I remember it 2-0. I remember it 2-1 when I scored to make it 2-1. And I remember saying, come on, we'll keep on going. And I remember it getting to 2-0. I remember Andy Aitken saying to me, what do we do now? I said, I've got a fucking clue. I've got a clue. <laughs> you know, and we probably did. We probably didn't take stock in the third goal we lost to Big Boy there was a poor goal to lose mm-hmm. but we were done in we were absolutely mm-hmm. physically done in but mm-hmm. by God we did party that night I'll tell you yeah I bet <laughs> yeah we did um, you know you had a, a, a good career in in Scottish football um, you know you even spent some time in the Highland League with, with Cove but away from football you're now um, working in oil and gas up in Aberdeen obviously not based in Aberdeen just now, given the pandemic being working from home. But you also do some work with the former Players Association. Um, I think it'd be good for those tuning in just to kind of get an understanding about what the, the former Players Association does and, and kind of what your role in, in that is. Uh, so I guess the former Players Association uh, has been on the go for years. You, you know, it was uh, started long before my time and but it kind of, there used to be a golf day every year. Uh, mm-hmm. Get all the ex-players together. Great day. But it kind of fell by the wayside. Uh, Duncan Davidson used to run it and poor Duncan was probably then uh, on his own. So it, 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 it's kind of asked myself and Russell to get involved. So we kind of got involved in uh, about five, five, six years ago now. And we kind of took it over for Duncan. Uh, and what, I'd come up with the idea of the ex-players game I've yeah, got heard, my, my programme here there you go I've heard Hearts done it uh, Hearts used to do it quite a bit and I think Hearts used to play with the Radio 1 or the 4th 1 sorry All-Stars you know and they used to have day charity games and I thought well, why, do, why do we not try that I, I think that if we done it up here it, we could do okay and we'll do it for mm-hmm. charity we didn't expect it, it to be as big a hit as it probably was and you know I think the, that game the first game particularly uh, in particular sorry uh, in Varuri yeah. you know I, I think it was really well reset it was a beautiful day I think you we know, lucky with the weather that day <laughs> we got very lucky with the weather you know it was 12 1300 fans in mm-hmm. you know we, we, we come up with the concept of playing the fans playing the Red Army mm-hmm. uh, just to give a wee bit back and I think we raised the best part of 15 grand the first time for charity mm-hmm. we gave it to the we decided to give it away to the Flood victims. Yeah. So I think mm-hmm. you know, and so and so what's happened since is Marcel Russell's Russell fell by the wayside. Marcel, uh, uh, Marcel, Jim White, Chucky White, uh, mm. and uh, God Walker McCall, mm. and oh, I forget. Uh, so basically, I've I've stopped doing it. Uh, so what mm. actually happened? We I'd, I'd organised the other game. Yeah. Again, we played and, you know, we'd got set up with the charity Aber Necessities as well. We wanted mm-hmm. to make uh, Aber Necessities our, our charity of choice and we're, you know, we're going to try and make as much money as we can over the course of a year for them. Obviously, COVID hit, but what actually happened was with myself was we used to have a monthly meeting and we'd organise golf days and these games and anything mm-hmm. else we could do. But unfortunately, I felt a need that we probably had to change committee members every maybe six months to a year. Mm-hmm. And the guys have been doing it for a period of time. And I thought, you know, son, I've got enough on anyway. I, I decided that I'm still always there to help them if need be, but I've, I've come out of the committee now. Uh, mm. I was hoping for some younger guys. People forget I'm the youngest at that by quite a bit, and I'm 48 <laughs> this year. So it's kind of to try and get some of the other, other younger guys involved. But mm-hmm. the players all that, you know, we I'd organised the game again that we played at Inverurie. Uh, 
in the charity, uh, the testimonial match for the guy that was at Inverurie. Mm -hmm. We played with him. They asked us to get a team together. And again, brilliant, you know, like of big Xander coming back up and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Paul Sheeran and Barry Robson, they just, we will flood, they all love to play, <laughs> you know, so no, it was good. It's, it's always good, Kevin McDonald, it's always good to get the, the guys together. Uh, we, end, we always end up after it and we always end up uh, rather worse for a worse. So mm -hmm. it's good. It's, it, hopefully it'll keep on going. Hopefully it'll keep on continuing and, and hopefully it'll keep on doing good things for, it'll be well supported and doing good things for the charity in the local areas. Yeah, the, one of the um, fuel managers at my work, um, he was on a few of the golf days. He wants to know if you still wear tartan trousers when you go out on the golf course. Wouldn't it be John, was it? Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I had Ian Porter breaks on one time I think I was playing with John that day actually mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 listen it, it's, it is it's, it's a, bit of, a bit of fun and a, and a bit of laugh and a joke so yeah I'd, I'd still get dressed up for the golf yeah but still I, I wanted to know if you did that but no I certainly agree that the, the initiative of the, the fans versus the former players was great you know I, I, I remember when Deborah phoned me to say that I'd been picked to, to do the one at Inverurie, I couldn't have believed it. Um, and, you know, Joey Harper was the manager. For, so you were playing that? So you were yeah, playing that? Yeah, I yeah. played in that game, yeah. Right. And uh, Joey Harper was our manager. And the first thing he said to us was, you know, you're not going to win. So just just go out and enjoy yourself. And I was thinking, that's rude. I'm like, I'm going to give it my best <laughs> shot here. But the one piece of advice he said to us, he says, these are pros. So I'll tell you, they're old and they'll get tired. So make the ball do the work. He says, because a ball moves quicker than a person. Does that? Unless I'm kicking it. Yeah. Well, my greatest achievement from that game was not Megan Barry Robson and I've got a photo of it. So oh, I'm taking that to the grave. Oh. Hey, do, do you know something about the initiative? And the thing is, you showed the programme. I remember coming down to the Tawdry, myself and Russell for the launch because you did the speech, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. For the launch, yeah. You know, and, and we were thankful because, again, keep on going back to players appreciate the fans. Fans probably mm -hmm. don't think at times, but players do, you know, and listen, there's nothing better than fans doting on you and, and, and you know, wanting you to sign stuff. And I think the funny bit about that was, and it's funny hearing that for you, but there was quite a few used boys that night were pretty bullish about their chances. <laughs> you know, and, and it was, you know, and it, we got that, or you are old. And, mm -hmm. and I think I said, we'll, we'll see Saturday. Yeah. We'll see Saturday. And, you know, and it was funny as well because I remember uh, we come on the Saturday, we hadn't seen each other for years, you know, mm -hmm. and we were on the dress room, we are having laughs and jokes and Mr. Hughes were out in the pitch for about two o'clock yeah. or two, ready to go. I think we saw her do about 10 to three. But it was, it was a great day. It was it was for a great cause. I, I, I think the only sad thing about it was there wasn't enough for us went out with us and, and, and had a drink with us after it, man. Mm -hmm. The truth is, my dad was dying. My dad had about two weeks to live. So mm. I'd actually, had, believe it or not, I did a phone call. I was getting picked up. Myself and Doogie Bell were getting mm -hmm. picked up at the, the Northern Hotel oh, yeah. uh, to get driven out to Inverurie. Mm -hmm. And I got about two minutes before I was meant to get in the car, I got a phone call from my brother to say, you need to come down the road. I, if dad makes it through the day, you'll be lucky. Mm. And I, I said, but I can't have got this game to go. I can't let, you know, I, if it mm -hmm. helped organise that, I'm not going to put it now. Because I actually missed the game the year after. I think we we played one at Cove. But I was yeah. positive, so that was away to Florida. Mm -hmm. So I so it was just that was probably the only disappointing thing was my dad ruined it for years, you know, he had to decide to go and get cancer and die on you. So uh, uh, but no, it was it was it was a great day, great cause. Glad that so many years got the chance to they wanted to change the concept and they wanted to make it a mixed teams. And I'm mm. always, I always start around and say, no, no, this is all about the boys getting together. And this was all about the fans getting the chance. Because I think if it had been five players plus six fans, it would have lost a wee bit of identity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the players who just get to play the players. Yeah, because I think, well, in the second event, they, they actually did training days for the, the fans. Because the first time we all met, on when we're up to Audrey to get the photos and hear about the day. And the next time we saw each other was walking into the dressing room at Harlow Park and your kind your kits up in the dressing room and that. But it was just such a great day. I mind whoever scored for the fans, Eugene Daddy got down on his all fours and we started doing the, the train celebration. But 
and I was marking him at corners and honestly it was like it was a competitive game nipping me and standing <laughs> on my toes it was just like it was you, you took it seriously because it was either you or Barry that was down the um, stand side and the ball went out for a throw in and it, it, was came, off of, I, it came off of you and, and you did not agree with the decision at all and you swore at the ref and you quickly said, sorry wee man, cover your ears next time to the little boy just stunned at what he just heard. It's just, it's just how we are, you know, and it's the greatest thing about it. Again, going back to, you know, the competitive age comes out, we're, listen, strangely enough, it, it, we were under no illusions that we're going to hammer you. We knew, mm. we knew that, we, we knew that, we knew, we knew that we'd pass the ball round you because we, when we'd keep some assemblance of shape at the back and, yeah. you know, we maybe can't run, but it's amazing. You're rough, we roughly knew where the ball was going to go before you guys knew where you were, were going to put it type thing, you know, yeah. and that's just what happens. But that was, as I say, it was a great day. The bit for me was the launch and I remember taking you down with Russell don't pass the manager's office into the bills of Petodre and with two keys into the... You just weren't aware, aware that your strips were all going to be hanging up no. with your numbers on it and with mm-hmm. two keys in, we opened it. And because we'd say then he's been doing here before into the first team dressing room. Because a lot of you probably have duty tours and, and that. hospitalities mm-hmm. and that. But when we opened the door, it was like a kid's face at Christmas. No. And it was special, it was special for us because that was that was a norm for us. But we were allowed to use... To be up, we, we were kind of when I say we were allowing you, that sounds bad, but what I mean is, we were giving you that opportunity to see how it felt and to get to get your faces and see the amount of you that took the phones out straight away and took pictures of your names with your strips mm-hmm. and your locker was amazing. So, no, it was great. I hope, as I say, I'm, I'm too old for all that nonsense now, and I've, I'm still more than prepared. I've done a couple of after dinner things with Joey and stuff like that, but. Mm-hmm. It's all about the fans and it's all about doing it for the fans and it's all about doing it for the, the people that support the football club. And mm-hmm. when my day, in, in my day, we used to, as players, probably do a lot more. But I think these days, it's, you know, we've, we've try, we're trying to encompass it. The ex-players help the football club out by maybe attending things that they, the players can't attend these days. So, yeah. now long may it continue. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I think just one final question uh, before we wrap things up. Uh, you heard you on Red TV not so long ago. So how was that? And then, so what do you make of how things are going right now? I think there's some some discontent with, amongst yeah. fans. Uh, but how, how how do you find th- think things are going with sort of how Derek's doing and how the team are playing? Carl, well, firstly, Red TV, I love. You know, it's it's an honour to go and do it. I, I think you know. I've always told them. I've always tell them as it as it is. You watch some of these other. I listen, even watch Red TV and, and, and there's a bias. You know, I'd love to be, I'd love it to be Aberdeen. I don't think it's fair in the fans. I was saying that to uh, my son the other day, you know, for me, I'd like to see how I, how I see it and how the mm-hmm. game was going rather than yeah. what I believe you are want to hear because yeah. you've got eyes and you are watching. Mm-hmm. You're, if I was saying, oh, Aberdeen have been great today against Habs, you'd be like, see for real. So, but going back to how it is, I, I think it's been disappointing. I think it's uh, that Disappoint in the sense that there's name and and, and I, I I don't know how it is for the players, but there's no excitement in the games. But I don't know mm. if again go back to us because there's no crowd. It must be difficult. I, I found it strange that day in, in Easter Road because it's very much just like a, a training game. You know, it was a closed door game, and and so it's difficult. What I'd say to the fans is. Don't give up on them. The, the, these players are trying. These players didn't want to go six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven games without winning, without scoring. Mm-hmm. You know that you, you train all week to win a game on a Saturday. Uh, I thought they played really well. I watched the game on Wednesday night. I thought they played really well in this to the degree of they look dangerous. And I think that's because it's something that I've been crying out for probably for a wee bit. I'm not saying Derek done it, but and, and certainly never done it because I've been saying it on the tape <laughs> teller a bit. I like the fact that we, we, on, on Wednesday night against Celtic, I never watched the game on Saturday. My son did. I never, but I'd like. I think we were, were we were more direct. You know, mm-hmm. we we got the ball up front. You can't mm-hmm. score a goal pass. I I can't believe that. And I said it on Red TV that we're two now again, two now doing against Hibs with two minutes to go, and Joe took a short by kick. Mm-hmm. See this this hill 
defenders going to take it for goalkeepers. That, mm-hmm. that baffles me. Mm-hmm. The goalies are the best strikers they've bought a football club. <laughs> but we need to score goals. There's only one place we can score goals, and that's we have the ball at the other end of the park. Mm-hmm. And I think until we get our confidence back and where we're being very full of flair, normal, you know, normal open play, I'd say get the ball forward. I felt felt really for the boy Fraser Hornby. No. First two or three games he played, you know, he'd have been as well sitting beside me because <laughs> six foot four, the board wasn't going up front, the ball never gets put in the box, you know. I just think for him, you know, Go and go and play off them, and and thankfully mm-hmm. we got the result. Thankfully we got the result on Saturday. That was a big mm-hmm. result, you know. Definitely. Do I, I think it's nonsense that the Aberdeen fans for a period of time they were calling for Derek's head. I think it's embarrassing the the people that are putting these the McInnes out uh, things at Petodre for the simple mm-hmm. fact we didn't train there now. So if you're going to do it, stick <laughs> it far, you might see it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, all joke aside. I, if there's going to be change, let's be changed. Let's things change in the right manner, in the right way, by the right people at the football club. Let's not be like the Green Brigade who think that they can go and just change a football club by the way, because they want it changed. Mm-hmm. You know, fans fans are there to support the football club. Fans have a voice, 100%. But for me, we're living in a, an unprecedented world where we're no sure of what's going to happen next. I think mm-hmm. Derek deserves at least this season... It, it deserves, in my opinion, the start of the next season when fans are back in. And guess what? See if things are not right. I'd like to think Derek would say they're not right. But by the way, we're still pushing for third. It's you know we're no mm-hmm. we're no bottom half. We're we're pushing for third. Hopefully, we get a result on Saturday. It's going to be difficult, but guess what? It's been done before. But hopefully, we, if we don't get a result on Saturday, I think what we've got to do is try. And with the last six, seven games of the season has just been positive performances and, and hopefully that leads into next year. Mm, well, you know, I think it's, it's a, a nice, honest assessment there. And I think, you know, it, it's refreshing to hear somebody speak their mind on Red TV. Calm, I think you'll agree after Willie Garner's performance on Saturday as well. Yes, definitely. I would agree. Yeah. No one said St- Stevie Cowan as well. Mm-hmm. It's tough at times because, again, these guys are maybe saying it how they think. You know, you want to be biased. I wanted to be biased. I want to double deep to win five. Now and tell everybody mm-hmm. it's, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, Real Madrid of Scottish football. It, it, <laughs> you know, the Hibs game was poor. It, but again, go back to it, you know, I, I, I couldn't do it with trying to hoodwink into people. You know, I, I've, watched, I've watched some of the other channels when I've been watching some of the Aberdeen games or some mm-hmm. of the other games. And some of it's just, you know, Rangers and Celtic TV, it's just downright embarrassing at times. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I, I've, I've seen a film that the commentators are asking for 10 years in the jail for the film, stuff like that. You're thinking, you know, and, and, and you know, like, even, I've got to be honest, I watched the Celtic game and without having to go to Steve Count, it was never a penalty. You can't mm-hmm. kick the ball off somebody's hand and, and, you know, I believe we're still, my son was saying that they're still going on about the penalty on Saturday. Mm-hmm. I'd love to be able to say, I'd love to be able to say that was a Stonewall penalty. It, it wasn't a penalty. But, see, I thought. See, it's funny. I thought it was a penalty, and Callum, you, you weren't, you weren't up for it either. Well, the, way I, the, way I, the, the way I always talk about penalties and, and refereeing decisions, if that had been up the other end and they'd given mm-hmm. a penalty, you'd have been going off your head, Glenn. You'd have been saying that was never a penalty. That's exactly what Callum off, said. What was he meant to do with his hand? What could he do? You know, and, and I always say that. I always think we should get away from the Arsene Wenger thought process. Arsene Wenger was amazing that he stood in the same place. He could always see decisions at one end, but he mm-hmm. never used to see them at the other end. You know, so it was amazing. It was amazing how many managers tend to say, "Oh, I, I never seen that one." Mm-hmm. Well, you've seen every other decision. Oh, okay. on the <laughs> but no, for me it wasn't a penalty. But again, Stevie was maybe Stevie. I think Stevie was trying to get a bit of excitement. I think, but no, Aberdeen. Listen, Aberdeen are better than Hibs. Are bigger than Hibs, and they should be finishing third. There has been a disappointing two months within the season that we've not played particularly well. At the same time, I think COVID has got a lot to do with it. And I know every team's facing the same thing, but I don't know how I would have coped with new fans. And I don't know how I would have got myself motivated mm-hmm. at times. You know, I'd like to think I would, but you never know. I would have been absolutely, absolutely goose. Because as you say, Glenn, you heard what I said at a charity match to a referee. Could you imagine? <laughs> every- Sky Sports, they've just been beat, 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 beat. <laughs> so, oh, 
yes, it's difficult times. Uh, hopefully, we can all get back to watching football soon and, and get back to, to supporting them again. Mm-hmm. Definitely, and I think that's a, a very good note to, to end things on there. So, Steve, um, from myself, I'd just like to say thank you for taking the time to come on. It's been a very open and honest chat, and, and that's something that both myself and Callum appreciate because mm-hmm. the, the honesty and the openness is what makes these these episodes. No, I thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Always do. Always here to help in any way I can. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, one last thing, I'd like to echo uh, Glenn's thoughts. Do you have David Zorich's number so we can get him to play up for on Saturday? We might need him. <laughs> David Zorich's number. I never had David Zorich's number when I played with him. Never <laughs> made And if, if, if we need David Zorich to play up front, I'm going to get my boots clean. Okay. Well, we could use your, you use your enforcement in the midfield. That wouldn't go amiss on Saturday. And you know how to win at Parkhead. Mm. Uh, two wins uh, the last two games, but I'm pretty sure my way of combative playing... Uh, would not go too, down too well in the modern game. I'd like to see that you versus Scott Brown on Saturday. That would be entertainment. Or... Mm-hmm. It's happened before, believe me. He's been put in his place a few times before. Perfect. No, Steve, thank, thanks very much. No, thank you. Speak again soon. Thank you.